Thank you, Russ. Um, you know, the, the final stories that Russ shared isn't something that's easy to hear, um, particularly with mental health and with suicide. And the next presentation that we have, really many of us find difficult to talk about, and that is our mental health. Susan Kane Williams, who's a highly experienced trainer with the Village Family Service Center, will help us understand the importance of taking care of our own mental health. She's gonna help us recognize some signs and symptoms of poor mental health and reduce the stigma of getting help um, in this area. So Susan, welcome to our conference. my first time stepping onto the big stage, so it's kind of exciting to be here. I was really pleased when Philip asked, um, called us and said, we're doing this conference, North Dakota Road Construction and D Department of Transportation, and we would like to talk about mental health. And I said, can you say that again? Because that's not usually the connection we find. Uh, and I'm, I'm really pleased uh, that the previous speaker, whose name I'm sorry that I don't know, he's sitting in the front row here someplace over here, I think, yeah, um, made that segue because it really is um, critical that we talk about mental health. And um, when I was introduced, again, the woman whose name I don't remember, I'm sorry, um, said that we often don't talk about it because it's difficult, it's awkward, it's personal. Um, it, should I stand closer here? Um, uh, so, uh, we want to do what our part to break the stigma, to make it normal. And so that's what I'm going to do today, I try to do today. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. If you have insights, I'm happy to hear them. So, we'll get started. I have the timer on my watch set, um, so I don't go over, so you have a little time um, um, between, your, between now and your next session. So, I want to show you a continuum here um, of health. And notice it just says a continuum of health. So uh, on the left is excelling and on the right is uh, in crisis. And you, we all fall someplace along that line at any given point on any given day. Uh, and I want you to think about your physical health. Uh, when we're on this continuum, what do you do to keep yourself in the green or in the yellow? Uh, we're not gonna be super engaged at this point. I just want you to think about that. Um, how far to the right are you willing to go before you get help? When do you go to the doctor? When do you take a day off of work? When do you say, yeah, I can't do this by myself anymore. I need some help, okay? So think about where that might be, what color you might be in. I'm gonna speculate based on my experience doing this presentation in other groups, um, in other settings, that it's gonna be probably yellow, maybe orange. For some people, it's gonna be red um, because you just can't let go. I, that's not uncommon, but typically it's going to be yellow or orange. Then I want you to think about uh, the same thing mentally. The same continuum, the same questions. What do you do to keep yourself mentally healthy? Where along this continuum do you have to get before you say, I need help? Um, and typically it will be in the red, probably far, far into the red because we just don't want to do that. If we go back to that previous question, what do you do to keep yourself physically healthy? Um, we take vitamins, we take medication, we exercise, we eat right, we sleep right, we pay attention to our environment. Um, uh, what, what are the things that make us unhealthy? We try to stay away from those things. The same is true for mental health. We eat right, we sleep right, we take medication, we take vitamins. Um, we even, on, the, on that continuum for physical health, we often stay in the, we go to the doctor when we're green, right? How many of us have done our yearly mammograms or our yearly colonoscopies or our annual, whatever the yearly thing is? We're healthy and we go to the doctor to make sure we stay healthy. Um, again, mental health, nope, 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 nope. I am in big trouble. And the further we get to the red, the longer it takes to get back to the green. So if we can uh, address those issues sooner um, and be more comfortable saying, yeah, I'm not doing so well, I'm not feeling so well, um, then we typically are better off. So mental health, the whole idea is mental health is health. It's not like physical health and mental health. It's 
kind of the same. Now we see different doctors for different reasons. Um, we, we have different symptoms for different illnesses, um, but it's all our health. And when one, one of those two pillars is struggling, the other one starts to suffer. Um, and when we separate mental health from physical health, or we separate mental health from health, we start to think it's something different and that it's weird and that we shouldn't be talking about it. Um, and that doesn't do us any favors. So I'm gonna t we'll talk a little bit about what, um, what are some of the causes of mental health or poor mental health. Um, here are some of them. This is not by any means a comprehensive list. But all of these things um, are factors. They're factors in our physical health and they're factors in our mental health. Some of them hit one side or the other um, more. But what we know that when we start feeling one of them, then we start feeling all of them. Um, so we, start, we are stressed, so we start drinking more. We start drinking more, so then we're not very fun to be around, so then we start isolating more. So then when we isolate, we get a little more stressed, we go into a bad environment, all sorts of things um, happen when we're doing that. So now, um, I wanna talk a little bit about what mental health is. It's just our emotional status, kind of our emotional um, well-being, how we, how we see things from an emotional perspective. It affects how we think, act, and feel. Uh, and it impacts how we interact with others, how we handle problems, and how we make decisions. So when we don't take care of our mental health, we don't make good decisions. When we're not taking care of our mental health, um, we're not handling our problems very well. And it's not the mental health problems that we're not handling well. It's the problems at work that we're not handling well. It's the problems with our relationships that we're not handling well. Um, when we're not making good decisions, it's, it's not a good decision to not take care of your mental health, but when you don't do that, you're also not making good decisions about what you're doing in your day, how you're spending your time, where you're putting your energy. Um, we don't interact well with others. We have a shorter temper. We have less tolerance. Um, we isolate. Uh, we stay um, closed in our own little space. Um, all of that is a result of our mental health, how we are tending to our mental health. So there's mental health which we, that's the big umbrella. Um, and I think one of the reasons we don't always um, address it, one of the reasons, um, is that we tend to think that mental, if we're not mentally healthy, we have a mental illness. And that's not the case. Um, there, there, there is, of course, mental illness, and we're gonna talk about the prevalence of that uh, in just a second. But we have to understand that it's a continuum. Mental health and mental illness is a continuum, the same continuum, just like physical health and physical illness. I might not be feeling great, but I'm not necessarily ill, right? Have you ever said, I don't feel good, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not really sick, I just don't feel quite right, okay? I'm, I don't have an illness, but I'm, something's, not, something's off. I have a little cold, I have a sinus infection. Um, I'm not sick, I'm just not well. We have to think of mental health the same way, along that same continuum. So uh, mental illness is this condition that impacts how we, mental illness, excuse me, a condition that impacts how we think, um, our, our thinking, our mood, and our behaviors. And here we are gonna do a little bit of um, interaction. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to out any secrets. I'm not gonna ask you to be super vulnerable. Uh, but I'm going to put up um, a list of mental illnesses, and I want you just to raise your hand. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to do, give a testimonial or anything. Just pretty simple. Raise your hand if you know someone who has this diagnosis. Now, if you don't understand, if you don't know what the diagnosis is, you probably don't know someone, so then don't worry about that. Don't get too caught up into the details of the language. But if you know someone in your personal life, in your professional life, your family, your colleagues, college friends, high school friends, whatever the scenario is, if you know someone who has a diagnosis of this, um, just raise your hand. Okay. Uh, the first one is con a conduct disorder. This is often the case. I think I might take it off the list because very few people know someone like that. Someone who is diagnosed with schizophrenia. Paranoia. Depression. 
for any kind of phobia. A panic disorder. An eating disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Oppositional defiant disorder. Dissociative disorder. Obsessive compulsive disorder. Bipolar affective disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder. Or get, sometimes they call it GAD or just anxiety. Uh, and the last one is attention deficit disorder. If you looked around while you're doing that, you, a lot of people raise their hand. And a lot of people raise their hand more than once. Mental illness is really quite prevalent. My daughter has a friend who, uh, she just said, well, Madeline's OCD. And I said, oh, I didn't know Madeline had OCD. And she said, mom, it's really prevalent. I said, I know. I just didn't know Madeline had it, <laughs> right? So it, a lot of disorders are prevalent. They're around us. We work with people who have the disorders. We don't know they have the disorder because it's managed. They don't have a cast on their leg. They don't have an insulin pump on their hip. Um, uh, but they have the disorder. It's, it's not, a, it's not an uncommon thing, um, even though we don't talk about it. Uh, uh, and of course, this is not a definitive list. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, it's a continuum, right? It's so mental health, mental illness, and really, it's not even a flat continuum like this. It's a bell curve. Everything in nature is on a bell curve. So um, when I asked the marketing team that I work with to, to create this arc for me, this bell curve for me, I said, I don't want it, I don't want too much white on the one end and I don't want too much black on the other end. I said, I don't think there's many, very many people who are 100% mentally ill. And I said, I don't think there are very many people who are 100% mentally healthy. And my marketing friend said, there aren't. <laughs> she said, immediately, none. There are none of us who are 100% mentally healthy all the time. We all fall someplace on this continuum in this bell curve at any given point on any given day. And there's a lot of variables that bring that into it. But the fact that we are struggling with our mental health, the fact that we are depressed a lot, the fact that we just can't get, get a clear thought um, straight, the fact that we can't stay organized, what, you know, whatever the c thing is, doesn't mean we have an illness. It means we are human. And we have to be willing to talk more about that, more freely about that. So um, one of the reasons we don't do that is because, uh, is that up on the screen? Yeah, okay. Um, because we have this stigma, this stigma about it that says something's wrong with me um, if I'm not 100% good all the time. Um, and the fact is, that's a myth. That's a big myth. Um, that is, that's, that's not even close to true. Uh, but st stigmas prevent people from getting help. They prevent people from offering help because we don't want to make it awkward for someone. We, um, they're subjective. There's, there's societal, because in some societies, certain things aren't a stigma, right? In America, we, we, we do it this way. In another country, they do it another way, right? Um, and so it, it's, not, it's not always um, a universal thing. Um, and stigmas are dangerous because it prevents people from getting help. Um, we all know stories, we heard one this morning, of someone who was, who was close to finding no solution but suicide and then got help. Um, and, and didn't make that choice. So stigmas are very, very dangerous. And we often say we're fine, right? So we say, how are you? And they say, oh, I'm fine. And um, this is really what we're doing um, inside. Um, we're not fine. Um, and there's nothing wrong with fine if there's nothing wrong. How was your drive to Bismarck? It was fine. Really, was it fine? Yeah, it was fine. It was not, nothing spectacular. Didn't hit a deer, but also didn't see a falling star. You know, it was all, right. It was fine. Um, but in our mental health, often it's more like this: How are you? And then inside, we're saying, "I'm broken. I'm unhappy. I'm scared. I'm hurt. I'm mad. I'm confused. I'm heartbroken. I'm sick. I'm terrible. Depressed. Lonely. Sad. Pissed. Angry. Unloved. Lost. I'm fine." And it does us a disservice. It does all of us 
a disservice. Sometimes we use this um, acronym for fine, frustrated, insecure, neurotic, or emotional. You can use your own F word at the top if you want. If you Google that, you'll find other ways that this is phrased. Um, and there's a, there's a asterisk by neurotic because one of the ways we can, one of the reasons there is a stigma, or one of the ways we can break the stigma, is to not use mental health terms, to mental illness terms, let me put it that way, to not use mental illness terms to describe common mental health struggles or behaviors, right? Um, oh, my kids are driving me crazy today. All right, you're not crazy, and crazy is kind of a weird term anyway, right? Um, or someone will say, um, my OCD is just out of control today. Well, if you don't have OCD and you're just um, kind of ramped up about some things, when you say, uh, my OCD is out of control today, someone who has OCD, and we just did that little experiment where we probably know someone who does and don't know that they have it, someone who has OCD hears you kind of making light of something that they struggle with every day, um, every minute of every day. We don't often do the same thing with physical health. We sometimes do. We're gonna go to the state fair, we're gonna say, I'm gonna have a whole day of diabetes today. And people with diabetes say, don't you dare make light of what I struggle with every day, all the time. And so we have to be wary of our language. That's one of the ways we can reduce the stigma of mental health, is not making light of, of mental health concerns when we see traits in ourselves. And it's common, it's frequent, it's universal, it's easy, um, and it's, no one's pointing fingers, we're just saying, I'm just saying, be aware of how what you say might, how that might make someone um, feel. So now they're not gonna be open about their disorder because they don't wanna be laughed at. I did, a, I did the thing, I think I'm pretty, I try to be pretty open, pretty aware, pretty um, on top of things. And a friend of my nephew's used to be a uh, project manager, uh, program manager for uh, an, uh, an association out on the East Coast for OCD, um, um, people with OCD. I can't remember exactly what his role was, but I, he was describing, he said, well, I work for the something, something, something of OCD. And I said, don't you mean, don't you mean CDO? <laughs> and he said, well, that's exactly why we exist, is because people don't understand the severity of that. I thought, oh, you're right, I'm sorry. I was just making a light joke, and I was being offensive to people I didn't even know, but I was adding to the stigma that mental health is something to be joked about. And it's not. Just like physical health isn't something to be joked about. Right? We don't make fun of people because they have diabetes. We don't make fun of people because they have heart disease. Um, all of those things need to be kind of brought to the, brought to the forefront. Okay. Um, so here on the screen, um, hopefully I've stalled long enough in my storytelling that you've had a chance to look at some of these other ways to reduce the stigma. Because when we reduce the stigma, we open up channels for conversation. And when we open up channels for conversation, we save lives, we literally save lives when people feel comfortable talking to us about their mental health. When people feel comfortable saying, I, I need help, I'm struggling. And you don't have to be in the crisis zone of that continuum. I guess for your perspective, it would be over on this side. We don't have to be in that red crisis zone to say, I need help. I, I, I wanna feel better than I'm feeling right now. What can I do? And there are, there are lots of things that people can do. So I have a couple of videos loaded here about some different ways that, um, some, just some different scenarios. The first one is not gonna play because uh, some, there's some weird thing with where it's hosted, so I can't play that one for you. Um, but I will play the next one, which is also Wayne Brady. So this comes from um, a website called um, Men Children's Mental, Children, Mind, Children's, Children's Child Mind Institute. And they asked a number of celebrities to share what would you tell your younger self? Now, you know, what you know now, what would you tell your younger self in relation to your mental health? 
Because one of the ways to reduce the stigma is to have people who people know speak out and say, I have that. Um, and then that kind of starts to break down that, oh, he's this funny guy who makes a billion dollars, <laughs> tons of money, making people laugh, and he has depression. Hmm. Maybe I'm not the only one who doesn't always feel on top of her game. Okay? So I'm going to let Br Wayne Brady tell you what he would tell his younger self. Hi, I'm Wayne Brady, actor, singer, improvisationalist, TV host, and I have depression. What I would tell my younger self is you didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes you feel so dark and you isolate and you question yourself and you think, what did I do to feel like this? The answer is you didn't do anything. It's a chemical imbalance. You have this inside of you. It isn't because of anything that you've done. And most importantly, don't be afraid to talk to people. Ask for help. Talk to your mother. Talk to, talk to a teacher. Talk to your best friend. Just talk to someone. I wish I would have told myself that when I was younger. In fact, I wish I would have told myself that 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, only recently have I really started facing my depression head on, talking, being open about it trying to develop the tools that, while it may never go away, my depression becomes something that I can handle and, and deal with on a daily basis, taking each day one day at a time. So I can wake up every day and tell myself that it's not that I've done anything wrong or there's something wrong with me. It's just that I now know the truth and I'm willing to ask for help. I'm willing to reach out. Um, and that's a really important part of this. To anyone who is struggling with depression and who feels like they're in that dark box, what I would say to you is just know that you can get help. There's light. I know when you're under the covers and you don't want to get out of bed and you don't want to engage with the world, and everything feels so dire and there's so much weight on your heart and on your mind that no one can help you and you're ashamed to ask for help. What if they think I'm crazy? What if my job fires me? What if the other people don't like me because I say that? What if I feel really different? All of those things can go away as soon as you start talking. There's no shame. Uh, you, you, you know what I find is the worst part about depression is feeling like um, you're drowning and you don't want to ask anyone to save you. That's, the, that's one of the worst things that we can do. So I would just say, please, talk to someone and just know there's no shame in it. Um, secrets kill. Keeping this a secret, it's the worst thing you can do. So, I'm Wayne Brady. I have depression, but look, I'm talking to you. I feel better already. That video is on a, if you Google Child Mind Institute or Google Wayne Brady depression, you'll find lots of videos like that. That one is one. Um, and you'll also find Kristen Bell, and you'll find Michael Phelps, and you'll find Emma Stone, um, and you'll find Prince Harry, and you'll find many, 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 many others. I'm gonna go back to Michael Phelps. Oops. What's up, guys? I'm Michael Phelps. Uh, I'm an Olympic champion, and I have ADHD. Uh, Growing up, I, I was somebody who was always constantly bouncing off the wall. I could never sit still. Um, if I could go back in time and tell my younger self something, I, I would tell him to, to believe what's in his heart and never, ever give up. 
Um, you know, that's something that, that I've lived with my whole entire life and, and will continue to live with. Uh, it's been something that's changed my life um, since the beginning. Uh, you know, I think, you know, I think the biggest thing for me, once I found that it was okay to talk to somebody and, and, and seek help, um, I think that's something that, that has changed my life forever and, and now I'm able to live life to its fullest. Um, I mean, I had kids who, you know, we were all in the same class and teachers would treat them differently than they would treat me. Um, I had a teacher tell me that I would never amount to anything and I would never be successful. Um, so it was a challenge and it was a struggle, but for me it was something I'm thankful happened and, and I'm thankful that I am how I am. I look at myself every day and I'm so so proud and so happy of, of who I am and who I've been able to become. It doesn't have to be a, a dark thing. Uh, it, can, it, it informs who we are and our journey informs how we see the world. And I think that's really a valuable thing to see famous people saying, I have depression, I have anxiety, I am bipolar, um, I have ADHD. Um, all of that helps us I, normalize that it's part of the world. It's okay. We're not alone. We're not the only ones. Um, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's helpful to see someone that you know <laughs> uh, who might be standing on the stage in front of you saying, yeah, I have depression. Um, and I uh, mentioned it to my friend, uh, another person in marketing. I said, man, when I first finally acknowledged that I, it wasn't seasonal, it wasn't just the winter blues, it was all the time. When I finally admitted that and started taking medication for it, oh, my whole world opened up. I became such a better partner, such a better mom, such a better um, worker, such a better person, such a better friend, such a more authentic version of myself. Um, and that started in 1994 when I started realizing I need some help. And then to, in 2000, when my youngest daughter was born, I finally said, I need some help all the time, not just in the winter. So since 2000, I've been taking an antidepressant um, every morning. Um, and I've, I think I can probably single digits how many times I've missed it in 23 years. Um, just because I, I'm not myself when I don't take that medication. Um, Wayne Brady said there's a chemical imbalance in my brain. I don't get enough something between this point and this point and it makes me feel weird and not good and dark and gray and lethargic and all that stuff. But when I take my medicine, I'm good. Um, and, and the same is true, I have high cholesterol. My body doesn't process it what, right. So every day I take Lipitor. I just want you all to know that, right? I'm not ashamed to tell you that. Um, and I'm not ashamed to tell you that I take an antidepressant because it's part of who I am. And I want to do my part to reduce the stigma because there's not, I'm not embarrassed about it. I'm not ashamed about it. So I, I guess back to the billboard story, I told my marketing friend that I told my doctor that, man, if it would help anyone get over that gap, get to help them make the distance between getting help and actually doing the help, right? That, that took me a while to get, if I could shorten that gap, I'd put myself on a billboard. And my marketing friend said, well, I can put you on a billboard. <laughs> so that's how I got this slide. Um, and I, again, I'm not sharing that story to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm sharing that story to help you start to feel comfortable. It's okay. It's part of the, it's part of the journey. Some people need medication, some people don't. Lots of different scenarios, but you don't figure that out on your own. You figure that out by talking to people, talking to a therapist, talking to a doctor, so talking to someone who has experience, being open to saying, something's not quite right. I just don't feel right. And I don't know what it is, so that help, can you help me figure it out? And then they can, and then you feel good. And then things change for the better. Um, one of the things that I think perpetuates the, the stigma about mental health is this idea, of, well, I'm just going to show you this video. Um, I'm just going to play this video that's going to explain it a little bit more. Uh, the sound guys, at the beginning it's really loud and then it um, calms down a little bit. So. Popular ideas about happiness will make you miserable 
if you actually hold on to them too tightly, believe them too much, or let them dictate how you live your life. And there are three big happiness myths in particular that create this happiness trap. The first is the idea that happiness is the natural state for human beings. You know, if you give human beings food, water, shelter, and loving relationships, they're just gonna naturally be happy. You've probably heard this myth in many, many forms. The reality is that the normal state for a human being is an ever-changing flow of emotions. Uh, emotions are like the weather, continually changing. Uh, you, you wouldn't say the natural state for the weather is a warm spring, sunny afternoon. It's natural in winter that it's going to be colder, in summer it's going to be hotter. Uh, and so it is with our emotions. You expect to feel anxious in challenging situations with an uncertain outcome. You expect to feel fear when there's danger or threat present. Now, the second big happiness myth links to the first one, the idea that happiness means feeling good. If you look at most dictionary definitions of happiness, it's described as a state of pleasure or a state of contentment. Well, if this is your notion of happiness, then there's no such thing as lasting happiness. Because how long does a good feeling last? Think of the happiest day of your life. How long did a state of pleasure or contentment last before there was some frustration, disappointment, anxiety, irritation? If I were to define the word happiness, I would describe it as living a rich, full, and meaningful life in which we feel the full range of human emotions. The things that make life rich, full, and meaningful don't just give us pleasant feelings. Like, think about building loving relationships. Think about people that you love and care about and you spend a long time with. Do you have a relationship like that in your life that only gives rise to pleasant feelings? When relationships are going well, there's often wonderful feelings of love and joy, but all relationships come with tension and conflict and difficulty. If you're a parent, if you have children, then you know that having kids brings a huge amount of meaning and purpose and fulfillment into your life. But what other feelings does it give you? Now, when I ask this question to audiences at my public workshop, there's a big laugh, and then parents start calling out anxiety, guilt, frustration, anger, rage. You know, it's like amazing how these people that we love so much can arouse such strong, painful emotions in us. So uh, this holds true for really any meaningful life project, from building a career, from looking after your body, from building a family. Uh, the things that make life rich, full, and meaningful give you plenty of painful emotions, as well as some very pleasant ones. And the third big myth that feeds into the other two is the idea if you're not happy, you're defective. More and more, human nature is being pathologized as signs there's something wrong with you and you need some medication to fix it. The reality is that if you're not happy, you're normal. Life is difficult. You know, I, I ask my public workshops, is there anybody here who thinks life is too easy, that needs some more difficulty in their life? Anybody in this room that, that needs some more pain and suffering? You know, life is hard and challenging. Not always, but a lot of the time it is. Uh, that video, that author, that speaker, um, is Russ Harris, and he has a book called The Happiness Trap. And it comes in a regular book, like a book book, and it comes in a graphic novel, cartoony style. Uh, and it's excellent. Uh, it helps people realize that being unhappy or not being happy, I don't want to ignore this side of the room. I'm sorry that I've been standing over there so long. Um, not being happy is not wrong. Now, I think we have to thread the needle because I've been talking about you might not feel good and that's normal, right? Both are true. So there are times when um, we think, oftentimes, when we as a society think that if we're not happy, there's something wrong with us. And that's what Russ Harris is talking about. And let me say that social media has not done us any favors in that regard. All we see on social media is all the mountaintop experiences, right? So now we get on social media, oh, I wish I was on a vacation like that. Oh, I wish I had beautiful kids like that. Oh, I wish I had a job that I loved. 
And in real life, we, 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 the people who are showing that, they're not showing the messy house. They're not showing the time they wanted to poke their kids with, in the eye with a sharp stick, right? They're not showing those things because those things don't meet the standard, right? Those things go against the stigma. They, they create the stigma. So no one advertises when things aren't going well. We only want people to see the sh bright, shiny side of us. So when we're on social media and we only see the bright, shiny, and we know that my life, our life, isn't always bright and shiny, hmm, there's something missing here. It must be me. Some, there must be something wrong with me because my life isn't bright and shiny. Let me tell you, their life is not bright and shiny either. They're just picking and choosing the parts to show you because we don't share those dark sides with other people either, right? When, when, when people say, how are you? I'm fine. We don't say, ah, I'm kind of pissed at my kids. <laughs> we might share it with our spouse or a close, close friend, uh, or I'm really struggling at work, or I've just been sad lately. We don't say that. No one says that. So if we start to say that, then we start to normalize it. That's how it's supposed to be. That's what it's like to live in this world. That's normal. And that informs our other experiences, right? Um, you know, there's lots of pithy comments about without the peaks, you don't get the valleys. Maybe I should say that the other way around. Without the valleys, you don't get the peaks, right? Um, you, we need uh, that full range of experience. We need to be able to experience happiness, 100%. We also need to be able to experience sadness and frustration and discouragement and disappointment. And when we don't experience those things, then we spend a ton of energy faking it. And then we're not at our best, which doesn't do anyone, again, any favors. So I think Russ Harris is right. Life is difficult, and when we're not, when we're not happy, there's nothing wrong with us. I think he doesn't go far enough to say, sometimes it's more than that. Sometimes we do have something that we need to tend to. Sometimes we're just, it's just not a great day. Okay, that's okay. But if we have just sometimes not a great day, a lot of days in a row, and we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, we don't see any way it's gonna get better, we start sleeping more, we start drinking more, we start ra lashing out more, that's not what he's talking about. That's not the life is hard stuff. That's the mental health piece that we have to address. Right? So, and it's a needle that we have to thread. And we don't always know, you know, we, we, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. That's true, life is hard, I'm fine. And then we get to a point where it's like, you know, this isn't, this, this part isn't, this is going on too long. So then we've got to back up and say, you know what, I, I'm going to get some help because I want to live better. Okay? So what, what I should have had is these realities up here um, at the same time while I was talking there. So they missed it along the top. And of course, the reality is at the bottom. Um, life is a full range of emotions, and all of those emotions deserve our attention, not just the good ones. We can't just shove aside the emotions that make us uncomfortable. We have to face them so that we are in control of them. When we set, shove them aside, we're like, I, um, nope, I'm not going to give you any attention. And really what we're saying is, I'm kind of afraid of you. I don't, I don't want to go there. But so then we live in fear. When, like Michael Phelps said and Wayne Brady said, when we talk about it, now we're in charge. Now I'm the boss of those emotions, which is how it's supposed to be. I get to be in charge of my discouragement. But I'm, I can't ignore it because it's still there. But I can decide to address it and own it, and then it doesn't last as long. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about depression, um, and I guess that's kind of what I was just talking about. Um, and in, when we did the hands raising thing, there, if you were looking around, um, you saw that depression and anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and um, ADHD were the four that had the biggest, um, the most people raised their hands. Okay? Post-traumatic stress, um, we, are, we are a little more familiar with that because it's in the media more. It affects a lot of our veterans, a lot of people who have experienced stress, first responders, um, people we see, rightfully so, as heroes, and then we see them struggling, and so that makes us pause, right? Um, um, 
ADHD. If there were any classroom teachers in here, um, and I said, who knows anyone with ADHD, they would all raise both hands and stand up, right? It's, it's, it's common, um, it, it's much more common. We see it in kids, we see it in schools, so we're, we're a little more comfortable talking about that. Again, depression and anxiety, the next two that were um, popular, right? Lots of hands raised. Um, those are ones where those are getting a little more personal, right? Those are getting less public and, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, those a little bit more. Not to single them out as they're the most important, but they are more prevalent um, and they, it hits a lot of us. Um, and when I say hits, it hits a lot of us, that's what I wanna talk about here, the difference between being depressed and having depression, right? Um, and it's not a judgment thing, it's just a where you are on that continuum. So we all have moments of being depressed. Um, a pet dies, a family member dies, we move, we lose a community, we, our, our team loses. Um, lots of factors make us feel blue for a day or two. Um, and, we, and we should own those feelings. That's, that's part of the life experience. But sometimes, but usually those feelings go away, right? Eventually they fade. If a person has depression, they, it doesn't fade. They feel like that all the time. If it's untreated depression, okay, they feel like that all the time. Okay? Um, and they can't just snap out of it. Sometimes people say, well, you gotta fake it to make it. That's true. There are times when you have to just fake it and then over time you feel better. But that doesn't change the chemical reaction going on in the brain of someone who has depression. Just like um, if you were to say to someone, um, just don't be depressed, just be happy. <laughs> That's like telling someone in Ricky Gervais's words, just don't have cancer, just stop having cancer. It makes the rest of us uncomfortable. We can't do that. It's a, men it's a physical condition. Mental illness is a physical condition. It just affects our brain and how we see the world more than it affects our body and how we can carry ourselves, right? So we can't just fake it to make it. We can't just not have it. Um, we can't, um, someone with an eating disorder, we can't just eat, right? There's something going on in our brain that's causing us to see the world differently. Um, so we need help with that, right? And we need to be able to talk to people about that. Um, I'm gonna show, I think I have time. I'm gonna show this video. Um, again, I'm not meaning to double down on depression. Any of the mental health disorders or any of the feelings that push us to the right of that bell curve could have a video like this. Depression is very prevalent in our communities. Um, so I think it's a good one to use as an example. Okay? I'm not singling it out as it's the most important one. It's just one that's, um, important to talk about because it touches a lot of people. So um, here's what depression looks like from um, a different perspective. I had a black dog, his name was Depression. Whenever the black dog made an appearance, I felt empty and life just seemed to slow down. He could surprise me with a visit for no reason or occasion. The black dog made me look and feel older than my years. When the rest of the world seemed to be enjoying life, I could only see it through the black dog. Activities that usually bore me pleasure suddenly ceased to. He liked to ruin my appetite. He chewed up my memory and my ability to concentrate. Doing anything or going anywhere with the black dog required superhuman strength. At social occasions, he'd sniff out what confidence I had and chase it away. My biggest fear was being found out. I worried that people would judge me. Because of the shame and stigma of the black dog, I was constantly worried that I'd be found out. So I invested vast amounts of energy into covering him up. Keeping up an emotional lie is exhausting. Black dog could make me think and say negative things. He could make me irritable and difficult to be around. He would take my love and bury my intimacy. He loved nothing more than to wake me up with highly repetitive and negative thinking. He also liked to remind me how exhausted I was going to be the next day. 
Having a black dog in your life isn't so much about feeling a bit down, sad or blue. At its worst, it's about being devoid of feeling altogether. As I got older, the black dog got bigger and he started hanging around all the time. I chased him off with whatever I thought might send him running. But more often than not, he'd come out on top. Going down became easier than getting up again. So I became rather good at self-medication, which never really helped. Eventually, I felt totally isolated from everything and everyone. The black dog had finally succeeded in hijacking my life. When you lose all joy in life, you can begin to question what the point of it is. Thankfully, this was the time that I saw professional help. This was my first step towards recovery and a major turning point in my life. I learned that it doesn't matter who you are, the black dog affects millions and millions of people. It is an equal opportunity mongrel. I also learned that there was no silver bullet or magic pill. Medication can help some and others might need a different approach altogether. I also learned that being emotionally genuine and authentic to those who are close to you can be an absolute game changer. Most importantly, I learned not to be afraid of the black dog and I taught him a few new tricks of my own. The more tired and stressed you are, the louder he barks. So it's important to learn how to quiet your mind. It's been clinically proven that regular exercise can be as effective for treating mild to moderate depression as antidepressants. So go for a walk or a run and leave the mutt behind. Keep a mood journal. Getting your thoughts on paper can be cathartic and often insightful. Also keep track of the things that you have to be grateful for. The most important thing to remember is that no matter how bad it gets, if you take the right steps, talk to the right people, black dog days can and will pass. I wouldn't say that I'm grateful for the black dog, but he's been an incredible teacher. He forced me to re-evaluate and simplify my life. I learned that rather than running away from my problems, it's better to embrace them. The black dog may always be part of my life, but he'll never be the beast that he was. We have an understanding. I've learned through knowledge, patience, discipline and humour, the worst black dog can be made to heal. If you're in difficulty, never be afraid to ask for help. There is absolutely no shame in doing so. The only shame is missing out on life. I love that at the end of that, he's got the dog on a leash. He's in control. Um, the dog is still there, but um, the narrator is in charge of it. Um, and that is really true. And this has become kind of a shortcut for friends of mine. How are you doing today? Oh, my black dog is here today. Sorry about that. I mean, it's really a powerful metaphor. Um, there's some other videos here um, that we are going to skip because I'm aware of time. Um, I just got off a plane the other day, we flew down to Florida, and I always smile when I hear, when you see the airdrop in the unlikely event of a drop in cabin pressure, an air mask will fall from the sky. And then they say, put your mask on yourself first, or you are that what they're saying is, or you're no good to anyone else, um, which is true. We have to absolutely take care of ourselves first. So when we're seeing things in ourselves or others, um, we need to take some action. So here are some signs um, of, I'm just going to flip to this one, um, red, uh, red flag signs that if you see this in yourself or others, you can think, um, they're going to need some help, I think, or I'm going to need some help, right? Especially in their, if there are changes, right? Uh, they haven't been anxious, and now they're anxious about everything. They're usually pretty energetic, and now they're super lethargic. Um, some of them are constant, they're like not a change. It's like if they have suicidal ideations, that's it. There's no like, well, yeah, but they didn't used to. You don't have to make that analysis. If they're talking about suicide, you need to get them help. Call 988 um, is the 911 of mental health. Okay, that's the phone number you can call at any time to get help with mental health. So if you're seeing these signs, pay attention. Ask, how can I help? Um, there are really valuable things. One thing you can do to help is know that it's okay to not be okay all the time. It's not necessarily, you know, we're not saying it's okay to just suck at stuff. That's not what we're saying. We're saying it's okay to not always be okay. You are not always going to be happy. But when we get to the point where it's affecting things, then we got to take some action. 
Okay. When it's long, lasting longer and it's impacting our relationships, how we work, how we see ourselves, we, we can't do that by ourselves. Okay. Um, here are some other steps so that you can do to take um, care to help y yourself and others. Um, pay attention to the illness, pay learn about the illness, know what, what is helpful. It's, easy, it's, it's really helpful to say, how can I help? Is it okay if I do this? Does it bother you if I do this, right? I have a friend who's an alcoholic and we went down to a, in my town there's a new little establishment and, I, and it's, a, it's a bar. Um, and I said, do you wanna go down to Frosty's or will that be difficult for you? Oh, thanks for asking. No, it's fine. She goes, I, I know where beer is if I need it. <laughs> You're not gonna push me to it, but the fact that I asked is what made the difference, is what, ma what mattered to her. The last slide that I'm going to end on is this one, um, because this is this is the super simple video to explain when you're having a conversation with someone with a mental health concern. We don't always know what to do. We don't always know what to say. So this video is about 30 seconds long, and it puts it exactly right. I've been pretty uh, stressed lately. Can I bounce some ideas off you? You don't have to solve it for me. I just need you to listen. Believe me, if I could just snap out of it, I would. It's like an ex-boyfriend that just won't stop texting you, you know? Well, that sucks. You're not going crazy. You're not alone. I don't know how it feels. I don't have the right word. But I'm not going nowhere. Can in here? Come on. That's how you do it. You just sit with them. That sucks. It's really, it's really, in my experience, that has been the biggest thing for me, is when people have said, I don't understand it, but I'll do what I can to help. That's what helps me. Uh, okay, I want to end on this slide. Mental health is health and we have to take care of the mental side of our health just like we take care of the physical side. Um, two, two last things. One, thank you for your attention. I, I, am, I thought, I wonder how many people are gonna leave when I start talking about this. And I don't know that anyone did, which is encouraging, um, that you are interested and willing to talk and hear about mental health. It helps break the stigma. It will help save lives. Um, it will help make lives better. Um, on the screen, the QR code is a survey um, about the session. You are welcome to take that if you choose. No pressure. I'm not going to you know, make you stay in here unless you do that. Um, and also, um, I often, I'm not prepared to do this. Uh, let me back up. I often share slide decks. So if someone is interested in getting this slide deck because you think it would help someone you know, someone in your organization. I'm gonna give you my email. I'm sorry that it's not on the slide, and I realize I'm going one minute over, maybe two minutes over. I apologize. Um, so if you're interested in, um, I will send you a copy of the slide deck with links to the videos. If you send me an email, swilliams, swilliams at thevillagefamily.org. I'll say that again, swilliams at thevillagefamily.org, um, and just ask for the mental health awareness slide deck and I'll send it off to you. Um, thanks for your time and attention and thanks for your work, um, um, your actual job work too. I know it's hard and I know um, not every, people don't always say, hey, you're doing a great job out there on the roads. I appreciate it, so I wanna uh, thank you for that. Have a great rest of your conference.